Esther, and I really appreciate the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I was asked to talk about SGLT2 inhibition another year on, and I also promise you I won't show the same slides I showed you last year. This is my conflict of interest slide. I have interaction with various companies, but I don't, have, I don't take any personal honoraria. So another year on, I think everybody is familiar with the mechanism, the inhibition of glucose absorption and an increase in urinary glucose excretion going along with an increased urinary sodium excretion, at least temporarily. And 2018, we've seen another trial with three large cardiovascular outcome trials, and one of the next talks will address it in more detail. And we learned a great deal from these trials because they examined different populations, EMPA, all subjects having present, uh, cardiovascular disease here 60% and here only 40%. So again, we learned something about primary and secondary prevention. And the data of these three outcome trials with respect to three-point maze all showed non-inferiority and superiority shown in the ampagliflozin and carnagliflozin trial, no superiority in the DECLARE trial, and Surprisingly, when we initially saw the Empiric Outcome Trial, a reduction in heart failure hospitalization that has been confirmed in Canvas and has also been shown in the DECLARE trial here, the combined endpoint of heart failure hospitalization and CV death highly significantly reduced. And looking at the high-risk population and the population with cardiovascular disease, there's no difference suggesting that this prevention of heart failure is something that also holds true for subjects with multiple risk factors. So it's fair to conclude, I think, that current thinking suggests that SGLT2 inhibitors reduce cardiovascular endpoints most likely through a reduction of heart failure-related events. And that may explain some of the differences that Derek just raised on the separation of the curves. So let's look at mechanisms. And this slide has been shown last year. So since we don't know anything about mechanisms, everybody is allowed to publish overview articles, and we also contributed to that. All the big journals published these articles. And note, we all use squares to explain the mechanisms. Another year on, <laughs> we keep going, publishing these articles, and now use circles. And um, the conclusion of all that, and I can only quote Dan, I don't know. So we don't know exact mechanisms, but still we've seen some interesting studies which I'd like to discuss with you. And these studies relate on the one hand to hemodynamic changes and on the other hand um, to metabolic changes. And I'd like to start here with hemodynamic changes. There's a very interesting study published by Roland Schmieder's group he examined in a randomized control crossover study in patients with type 2 diabetes the effect on central systolic blood pressure as a surrogate for afterload arterial stiffness. And in previous studies, this has been linked to future cardiovascular events. And to make a long story short, in a trial randomizing placebo versus empagliflozin, he could show a significant reduction of central systolic blood pressure, as well as some other parameters of arterial stiffness, suggesting that ampagliflozin treatment exerts beneficial effects on vascular function and central hemodynamics. Then Silvio Insucci published a very interesting analysis from the Empireg Outcome Trial, a mediation analysis. A mediation analysis basically helps you or tries to find out which of the components that changed in the trial may contribute to a certain outcome in here. And here it turned out that a large proportion of the effect seen in Empireg Outcome is due to changes in hematocrit and hemoglobin, suggesting that Volume contract, contract, contraction is a key determinant of the beneficial effect seen in this trial. And in the beginning of the year, very nice and interesting study got published looking at this in more detail. And this study looked at the differential regulation of interstitial versus intravascular volume comparing SGLT2 inhibitors versus loop diuretics. In this study, dapagliflozin was used in a loop diuretic, bumetamide, and they used the model and calculated 
the reduction in blood volume here, and you can see the loop diuretic, and that's what we see in the clinic every day, leads to a large reduction of blood volume to a lower extent in the SGLT2 inhibitor treated group, and both of these drugs led to a reduction of interstitial fluid. But if you calculate the ratio here, it turns out that the relative reduction of intravas, intra interstitial fluid is much greater in the subjects treated with dapagliflozin compared to the loop diuretic, suggesting that SGLT2 inhibition leads to reduction of interstitial volume with limited effects on blood volume. Does that help? Well, let's put that together. This is a very nice overview article published by Subodh Verma and John McMurray. This is the situation of a decompensated patient with interstitial edema and congestive heart failure. And so the SGLT2 inhibitor reducing interstitial volume more than intravascular volume leads to reduction of the edema without an effect on the vasculature here. Why the loop diuretic, and this is typically what we see in patients that we treat with Lasix, leads to a strong reduction of intravascular volume and subsequently a moderate reduction in interstitial volume. And this effect here leads to activation of the neurohormonal system. And this is something we see in our patients. So these data suggest that SGLT2 inhibitors may selectively reduce interstitial fluid, and this may limit the reflex neurohumoral <laughs> stimulation that occurs in response to intravascular volume contraction with traditional diuretics. An interesting idea, I think, to um, follow. Then, just a couple of weeks ago, we've seen a clinical trial looking at heart function and <coughs> heart diameters here, and this is the EMPA heart study presented at the American Heart Meeting four weeks ago. The study has not been published yet, so this is taken from the presentation. This was a randomized study to evaluate the impact of SGLT2 inhibition with empagliflozin on left ventricular remodeling assessed by cardiac MRI. That was the primary objective, and in addition to that, the study sought to identify pathophysiological mechanisms of empagliflozin-associated LV remodeling. It was a randomized study, almost 100 patients with type 2 diabetes. They had to have coronary artery disease, but normal left ventricular function, only 6% of them had a history of heart failure. So no heart failure present in this population. Follow up six months, and the primary endpoint is said change in LV mass. In this study, the six-month treatment with empagliflozin led to a significant reduction of systolic blood pressure here, difference compared to placebo almost seven millimeters of mercury, and a non-significant reduction in diastolic blood pressure. And with respect to the primary endpoint, the study showed a significant reduction of LV mass index in subjects treated with empagliflozin compared to placebo. Secondary endpoints taken from the MRI was the left ventricular systolic and diastolic volume index as well as left ventricular ejection fraction. As you can see, no significant difference after six months. And they also assessed biomarkers and could not find a difference in levels of NT-pro BNP, troponin I, or ST2, which is a marker for heart failure. But please note the levels were very low here in this population. So the authors concluded from that study that empagliflozin results in beneficial effects on LV remodeling at six months among patients with type 2 diabetes and stable CAD, but without, with normal ejection fraction and a clear history of heart failure. So the authors propose, and this is current thinking, that during diabetes there is remodeling in the ventricle and the heart due to several components here, hypertrophy, inflammation, remodeling of the extracellular matrix and other mechanisms. And the data suggest that SGLT2 inhibitors may reverse some of these effects, thus leading to a beneficial remodeling in treated patients. Let's shift gears and look at 
cardiac metabolism here. And you all remember the story we discussed over the last two years, the ketone hypothesis, initially brought up by Ella Ferranini, suggesting that treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors leads to a better oxidation of ketone bodies, thus providing a kind of super fuel for the heart. But this has been debated, and several people raised potential harmful effects, suggesting that oxidation of ketone bodies is inhibited and that this may have adverse effects. So the question is, why would, in the context of heart failure, ketone oxidation may be an issue here? And there's a very nice study published two years ago suggesting that there's an increased utilization of ketone bodies in the failing heart. So in a very nice animal model, it has been shown that certain, several of the key enzymes involved in ketone utilization are increased in subjects with heart failure here. So we were interested to see whether treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors have an effect here. And this is unpublished data I'm sharing with you. We used DBDB mice on a high-fat Western diet with or without empagliflozin for five weeks. And we assessed cardiac function, and we did not see any changes in systolic function, but could nicely show that empagliflozin here significantly improves diastolic function. But in contrast to what has been proposed, we did not see a difference here in the, key, in the expression of the key enzymes in ketone utilization, nor did we see changes in ketone oxidation. This year, in a very elegant paper, this has also been shown by Subod Verma's group in DBDB mice with or without empagliflozin. They could show in untreated mice um, a reduction of cardiac energy production relative to normal hearts. And in their model, empagliflozin treatment led to an increase in ATP generation. It increased it by 30% here. And interestingly, this was based, this was due to an increase in glucose oxidation as well as in fatty acid oxidation, but this is ketone oxidation here, no difference at all, suggesting, and this is, I think, maybe the end of the ketone story, that SGLT2 inhibition enhances the cardiac energy pool by increasing cardiac energy production from glucose and fatty acids, but not from ketones here. There's another source of energy here, and we got into this using a very different approach. We used an unbiased approach, a metabolomic approach, to look for changes in, the, in metabolites in patients treated with empagliflozin. We treated patients with empagliflozin for four weeks here. The patients were pretty similar to the patients that were enrolled in the Empiric Outcome trial performed this untargeted metabolomic approach and performed pathway analyses. And to make a long story short, we could show that treatment of empagliflozin increases the catabolism of leucine, isoleucine, and valine, so branched chain amino acids here. And it turns on the TCA cycle, suggesting that the catabolism of branched chain amino acids is increased in subjects treated with SGLT2 inhibitors. How does that relate to heart failure? Well, there's a very nice paper published two years ago suggesting that in heart failure, the catabolism of branched chain amino acids is disturbed here. And this is a model of heart failure here, for example, the mitochondria. In heart failure, branched chain amino acid catabolic activity is decreased leading to accumulation of branched chain amino acids and keto acids. And these, this accumulation has direct effects on the heart on the one hand by interfering with the electron chain transfer, in addition to that leading to oxidative stress, and by directly activating certain signaling pathways like the mTOR pathways, and these together lead to cardiac hypertrophy and dysfunction. So having seen that SGLT2 inhibitor treatment increases the catabolism of branched chain amino acid. Our current hypothesis is that this increase in catabolism leads to a reduction of the accumulation of these amino acids and may thus have beneficial effects 
on the different components here by interfering with the electron transfer chain, the generation of reactive oxygen species on the mTOR pathway. We currently examine this in mouse models, but this could be an alternative idea to explain some of the effects seen on the heart. So our hypothesis now is since branch chain amino acid catabolism is diminished in heart failure, empagliflozin or probably also other SGLT2 inhibitors could potentially restore these defects and provide an optimal energy source and exhibit direct effects on cardiac function by influencing various signaling pathways. So putting all this together, over the last year we learned some, something about the mechanisms here and some of the effects, reduction of interstitial edema, reduction of wall stress here, effects on uh, cardiac bioenergetics, putting this together. One hypothesis is that SGLT2 inhibitors prevent heart failure prevent congestive heart failure. And the question is, do we have data for that here? And there's a very nice animal study published last year in a mouse model of non-diabetic mice with TUC. This is um, constriction of the aorta, and these mice develop heart failure here and develop a decrease in left um, ventricular ejection fraction here. And this has been examined in mice treated with vehicle or EMPA. And as you can see over time here, mice treated with vehicle exhibit reduced cardiac function, while treatment with empagliflozin for, in this study, only two weeks led to a preservation of cardiac function, suggesting that a deteriorating effect in this model may be prevented by treatment with an SGLT2 inhibitor. This is mouse. Do we have human data? We don't have human data yet, but a very nice study, very interesting study, has been published this year or last year looking at biomarkers. This has been a retrospective analysis of a study in more than 600 patients with type 2 diabetes and moderate increased cardiovascular disease that were randomized to canagliflozin in two different doses or placebo. And in this retrospective approach, the investigators analyzed biomarkers associated with heart failure or cardiovascular disease, such as nt BNP here or troponin I. And as you can see, in the placebo group over time, this is two years here, in these subjects, there's an increase in nt BNP as well as an increase in troponin I here, and a significant reduction of these biomarkers in subjects treated with canagliflozin here, true for anti-proBNP as well as for troponin I, suggesting that SGLT2 inhibition may prevent or delay the development of cardiovascular disease, in particular the development of heart failure. So putting all this together that we learned over the last year, I think one idea or one hypothesis is that these early effects here seen already in the empiric outcome trials after three weeks may be explained by effects on sodium depletion, by effects on the interstitial volume and hemodynamics, while mid and long-term effects seen with these drugs may be due to cardiac remodeling, cardiac metabolism, or cardiac function. Again, there's a lot of work to do, but this is, I think, summarizing how we could think about the results we've seen in the clinical trial. So to summarize my talk, SGLT2 inhibitors reduce cardiovascular endpoints in subjects with diabetes and high CV risk, most likely through a reduction of heart failure-related events. SGLT2 inhibition may prevent or delay the development of heart failure, and various mechanisms seems to contribute to these beneficial effects. Last but not least, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the people who did the work in our lab, Dr. Lerke, Dr. Schütt, and Dr. Kappel, as well as Julia Müllmann, who's a PhD student in the lab. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.